Happy Tuesday. Welcome back to Post Sports Live. I'm your host, Jonathan Forsyth, and uh, went back from our one week Memorial Day hiatus. LeVar Arrington joining us in studio, Dan Steinberg of the Bog, and Mike Wise. You've been uh, away covering the NBA for a while. Nice yes, I have. That. Yes, I have. Are you covering yeah. the finals? Uh, yes, I am. I oh. am. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Yeah, a little Tex-Mex in San Antonio, South Beach. You've been there, LeVar. Tex-Mex. little yeah, rematch absolutely. of last year. We're going to talk yeah. about the NBA Finals at the end of the show with our bold prediction segment. But first, we'll talk about the Capitals. Obviously, there's huge news, obviously, the week that we take off, the day before <laughs> on Memorial Day. The Caps announced a new G- GM and head coach, Barry Trotz and Brian McClellan. Um, so we'll talk about your thoughts on what differences you expect out of the organization next year. Uh, for the Caps. We'll go to, we'll catch up with Adam Kilgore on the return of Ryan Zimmerman and what position he'll end up playing. Uh, it looks like left field at least initially, but then when Harper returns from the DL, we'll talk about that. Um, we're going to talk about the Redskins pride fiasco from last Thursday and um, the social media backfire that, that happened to the Redskins. Jason wrote a column on it today. Uh, get your guys' thoughts on whether the team is closer than ever now uh, to changing its name based on the recent uh, flap there. And then we'll get into the bold predictions. NBA Finals, Stanley Cup Finals, and the Belmont. Triple crown possibility this weekend. Um, get your guys' thoughts on those. All right, uh, Dan, I want to start with you on the Capitals news. And instead of sort of getting your takes, because everybody's read the, the feedback on, on the trots and McClellan hires, what do you expect to be, if you had to say one or two things, next year that will be different under this new management for the Capitals, what would they be? I'm going to take an optimistic approach here. I'm going to say I think that this is going to become a much better possession hockey team, which has been one of their big issues. I think, obviously, they were great on the power play under Adam Oates. He revitalized the power play. That pushed them on the verge of a playoff spot for much of the year, and it pushed Ovechkin to 50 goals again. But that's not the way you win, certainly not in the playoffs, and, and you can't sustain it in the regular season either. And so. Trotz's teams have been good at possession, at the possession game. They have been good at five on five. And he made it pretty clear at his press conference that all the newfangled stats that people love, the Corsi, the Fenwick, these stats that show how much you have the puck, mm. how much you have the, in the opponent's zone, I, he cares about those things. And so I think the fact that his teams have been good at that, the fact that he's already stressing that, I think the Caps are going to be a better five on five possession hockey team. And it's kind of like in the weeds a little bit, but I think that that bodes well for their chances. Well, they certainly were not very good at even strength this year, so that would certainly bode well for them. Mike, what do you what do you expect out of this new regime next year? Two things. One, I expect Ted Leonsis not to blog uh, mm. about individuals on his site. <laughs> the Brian McClellan made that clear to him, apparently, and, uh, and he had it on his uh, blog, in which, you, you know, it doesn't show a unified front if your owner is a- actually out there picking apart your players, even in general terms. So I think there's going to be I think there's less that. That's kind of ancillary. On the ice, I expect Alex Ovechkin to finally become a better defensive player. And I think that his coach is going to demand this. More importantly, I think his teammates and the organization is going to demand this. And he doesn't want to be left alone as this $9 million a year prima donna that scores 50 goals a game. I think he gets too much blame anyway for a guy that's not on the ice like LeBron has the ball or a quarterback has the, 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 the football. Big yeah. skin. But, but I don't believe... Uh, that Alex Ovechkin wants to end his legacy here as a guy thought of as not playing defense. Well, that would be interesting. All right, LeVar, give me your, what you expect out of the new regime next year well, for the Caps. I, I had an opportunity to, to actually interview uh, Coach Trotz uh, once he was announced, and the one thing that I asked him about that, that is very noticeable about this Capitals team is they appear to be, in a, a soft way of putting it, too finesse with mm-hmm. what they do. Um, some would kind of decode that as soft. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think what Trotz will bring, and, and he spoke about this at length, is is the ability to be more physical. I think he used the term sawing off arms and different things like that. Uh, this team needs to be more physical if they're going to be able to to take that next step and and being able to be competitive. Obviously. The, the, the possession of the puck and being able to play at, at full strength uh, is going to be a challenge. But I think sometimes it just really comes down to the bare minimum of are you going to um, impose your will on another man's will and can you make them uh, give in to, to what it is that you're bringing out there on that ice. And I think that Trotz uh, will identify the guy. So this could be an identification year 
so to speak, for, for this new group. But he's going to identify his type of guys, and then a lot of it is going to have to do with skating and toughness. You mentioned identity. Oh, go ahead, Dan. No, I was going to say, none of us mentioned McClellan, and I think that's not a coincidence because I think none of us really know what right. this guy is going to do. He was not... You know, he's not a hot candidate around the league, certainly, and he was a guy that was in the background for most of his time here. So, I mean, it's hard to say what he's going to do. I think initially people were worried, is this guy like a George McPhee disciple who wants right. to carry on? I think that he's probably made it clear that that's not what he wants to do, but I don't think any of us really knows what he wants to do. I, I just, to Laura's point, th this team has is, is, is been so frustrating in the playoffs, and they're just this regular season tease that like, anybody that goes to a Verizon Center game realizes it's one of the great entertainment uh, commodities in this town right now, whether it's a concert or whatever. You get excited, you go, but you want them to see them take that next step. To LeVar's point, they got to be tougher. Yep. They just have to be tougher. That's a good place to leave it. And we'll talk about it, realistic expectations for the new regime going forward in, in future episodes of Post Sports Live, so don't miss it. All right, let's catch up with, uh, this morning we had an opportunity to catch up with Nats beat writer Adam Kilgore, who was in Woodbridge last night following the rehab assignment for Ryan Zimmerman playing left field. Let's hear what, uh, what Adam has to say about the rehab assignment. Joining me now is Nationals beat writer Adam Kilgore. Adam, welcome back to Post Sports Live. Thanks, John. Great to be on with you. Uh, Adam, you were in Woodbridge last night uh, covering Ryan Zimmerman's potential last rehab game. Um, the question here is, do you expect Ryan Zimmerman to play left field exclusively until Bryce Harper returns from the DL? Um, you know, it's hard to say exactly what to expect because they haven't been very clear or open about that. Um, but the more the this sort of plays out, the more I would say that, yeah, I do expect that. Um, and, you know, Ryan last night after he played nine innings in left field in Potomac, he kind of hinted that that's what he thought the case was going to be. He said, well, I don't know. I haven't really been told. But, you know, Bryce comes back, you know, in about a month or so. And kind of what it sounds like that his ex expectation is that he's going to be playing essentially every day in left field uh, or most every day uh, until Harper comes back. Uh, you know, if they want to give Walter Day off, they have the option to put Zimmerman at first. And, you know, if they want to give Danny Espinosa a day off or get Rendon a day off or, you know, if Espinosa is something with the bat and they want to sit him, then they sell the option to put Zimmerman at third as well. Let's fast forward about a month for when Bryce Harper is supposed to come off the DL. Mm -hmm. um, do you see, I guess some of it might depend on how he does in left field, but do you see sort of a combination of him playing left, third base, and maybe even a little bit of first base once Harper comes back? Yeah, that's, I think that's exactly right. Um, you know, the, the problem with him playing uh, first base is that LaRoche has been, you know, their, their best hitter this year, really, when he's been healthy and in there. Um, and so you don't want to get him a lot of days off. You, want, you know, he, he needs to be in the, in the lineup. Um, and so I think a lot of dates going to be a choice probably between Denard Spann and between Danny Espinosa. You know, do you, do you put Zimmerman at third base? Um, you know, if that's even still uh, feasible, you know, depending on how his arm feels and how he, how he does. You know, do you, do you do that or do you sit Denard Spann and play Bryce Harper in center? Any indication from uh, the front office or from Matt Williams specifically as to how he'll manage this sort of somewhat delicate situation? Uh, well, you know, they've already kind of shown a little bit of how they're going to do it, um, which uh, honestly kind of include a lot of lying to start. Uh, <laughs> you know, two weeks ago when uh, I was asking people and it was blatantly obvious that something was going on because Ryan Zimmerman was playing left field and practice every day, they just said it was for uh, conditioning, quote unquote. The, how convoluted and preposterous that explanation <laughs> was kind of let you know exactly what was happening. But I think the most delicate part is still to come, like we talked about. I mean, you know, what is Denard Spann supposed to think? He's playing pretty well right now. He's stealing some bases. Uh, his bat's coming along. He's their best defensive outfielder by a lot. Um, and, you know, the plan to put Zimmerman in left when by the time uh, Harper is back, uh, you know, a lot of days he might be the odd man out. So um, how's, how's he going to like that? You know, that doesn't seem entirely fair to Spann. Either way, their, their offense is, you know, set to get a lot better with his bat return to the lineup. No question. And that's the biggest... You know, reason why they're doing all this moving around, you know, is because they haven't really scored runs all year with so many guys injured. Um, and now, you know, starting tonight, it looks like um, they're going to have their whole lineup except for Bryce Harper's. Well, Adam, thanks for joining us on Post Sports Live. As always, we'll be watching your reporting through the situation closely. All right. Thanks, John. All right. So I want to ask you guys a tiebreaker. Put yourselves in Matt Williams' cleats, Mr. Wise. 
If you are Matt Williams, what position do you play Zimmerman in once Harper returns? I think you put him back at third base, and, and this is why. Bryce Harper was a, a, still a key to your offense, even when he was struggling, and I don't think you want to mess with too much here. Now, yeah, aside from the line, you don't take Denard Span out, for one, and aside from worrying about Ryan Zimmerman's throws from third, which is a big thing. If he can get past that a little bit, I think you've got to suck it up and play him there and, and know that he can go to left field. So you play him in left field for a month and then move him to third base Correct. once Harper comes back. Dan, what do you say? You know, I think what he said aside from the throws, I don't think you can say aside from the throws at this point because right. we've, we've seen him struggle for such a long period of time now. And obviously from the way he talks about it, it pains him to, to struggle like that. And I think it got in his head a little bit. And I just... I, you're bringing him back for his bat at this point. You need his bat in the lineup. I don't think that you need to mess with Ryan Zimmerman's head at this point by moving him back and forth. And if he starts having those issues again and you have to switch him back to the outfield, then you're kind of explicitly benching him because you, it's clear that he can't play the position anymore. I think that would be more embarrassing, I think more damaging to his pride. He's handled this as well as you could possibly handle it. He hasn't complained for one second. He hasn't made an issue about it at all. He's set to leave the position that made him famous and play left field, which is where you put uncoordinated oaths he's just he's just doing that and I, wow. I don't think that you uncoordinated major league baseball Michael playing Morris ball. was uh, yeah, yeah okay but I, I don't yeah. think at this point I don't think that you shuttle him back and forth and I don't think that you put him at risk of embarrassing himself at third base that's a good argument LeVar break the tie I'm going with Mike I think you keep him at third base and, and the reason being is players are players and and what I know of baseball when uh, when a guy can't do shortstop or third base anymore, I, I, they generally go to first base, correct? It's yeah, you have first no base more, and left field are generally It's basically because you have no more yeah. athletic ability left. So <laughs> I, that's, that's where, that's where um, I play in softball now. <laughs> so I, I, I'm, I'm in agreement. Like, I agree with both, actually. But I think third base because, one, you don't want to sacrifice uh, what chemistry that you may be building with the team, for one. Uh, for two, uh, I do think that it comes down to you have a job to do. If you brought me here to be a linebacker, you don't move me to defensive tackle because I can't do what I did as a linebacker anymore. You you generally come off of the field if you can't do that. So I think that you got to show and prove. Show that you can be on the baseball diamond or you can't. I think that's kind of what it comes down to. I think there's also a domino effect. And in your, in your scenario, Dan, who's the odd man out? Span. I mean, span. 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 Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so I don't see a guy who's hitting 311 right now. His I, last 10 games. His yeah. last 10 games, and a guy who does get around the base path a little bit. I don't know if you take him out. I, I, I also think that down the road, there's a danger. Putting Harper in center field is a danger as well. I mean, this is a guy who he needs to learn the responsibilities of, of what he's doing at this moment. He doesn't need the responsibility of center field at this, at this uh, juncture. I mean, I think that it... If it was an American League team, it would be pretty obvious, though, that yep. Zimmerman's the, the DH. Hitter, right? yeah. I mean, that's what he is. I think. Two, two other factors. One of the, I don't think this came up. Uh, we edited it out of the Adam interview from this morning. But Adam mentioned that Harper loves to play center field and has hit better, maybe coincidentally, but when he's played center field in the past. And Anthony Rendon is a more natural third baseman. So if you keep Zimmerman at third, you're risking the arm, but you're also putting Rendon in a second base position that he's not as comfortable at. So that's another factor in the whole process. But it's going to be fascinating to I see mean, how Williams handles it. I think the other thing is the, it. that all of this also presumes that everyone else is healthy. And they've right. been so beat up all year that, I mean, odds are someone else goes down and you're juggling point. something again. Absolutely. Another thing to presume is that Zimmerman doesn't stay healthy. Right. So he's like the nene of of the of Being the, a negative the nationals. Nancy. Come on, is that negative? <laughs> or is that we're also assuming that Zimmerman it's realistic with this game. Yeah. I mean, Zimmerman's a great classic guy. I'm just, but we're also assuming that he doesn't fall on his face in left field. Obviously, yeah, exactly. that could yeah, be the decision. Big, 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 big picture. picture. It'll be fun. To, it's gonna be fun to watch. Big picture. Starting Ryan tonight. Zimmerman, 100 million dollar contract. Jason Worth, past 100 million dollar contract has not has never been an All Star. You got to start looking at these deals if this season doesn't work out the way people think it's going to. All right, let's transition, guys, to the Redskins, who uh, had their first uh, full squad practice in the spring. I guess it was an, was that considered an OTA? OTA uh, yeah, last organized. week. Yep. Same day, um, the Redskins decided uh, to to start a Twitter campaign in response to Senator Harry Reid's. Um, calling for the team to change its name. They used the hashtag Redskins Pride. It backfired. Mike, your thoughts on whether the team right now at this moment is closer than ever 
to changing its name based on the recent PR flap? Well, I, PR flap or not, I think that eventually the name is going to change. And, and it's been a slow and regular drumbeat for the last year and a half. The interesting thing is the three largest things to put this thing on the rails, to me, is Robert Griffin III turned into a superstar and the franchise mattered again and people started paying attention to it in a new elevated state of American consciousness, I guess, in sports. Two, the owner said never. Once you, said, once, you, once you say never and put it in caps, you're basically putting your chin out there and say, I dare you, hit me. And you're, put, and you're making people on the fence go, wait, 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 he's not even talking to these people? And three, the, between the co-talkers on the field, the original Americans Foundation, and this, this uh, Twitter campaign, you're your own worst enemy. If you want to keep the name, just shut up. Say, we're going to keep the name. We respect that people disagree. We're going to keep the name as long as we legally can. And shut up and do your charity work underground. That's all you need to do. Dan, you were all over this on the bog, obviously, last week. What are your thoughts? You know, ultimately, I, I don't, I think it's interesting. I, I'm fascinated by the entire story, and I will keep writing about it, even though people want me to stop. But I, I don't think this really is going to affect much, because I don't think this is an issue that's going to be decided by public opinion. I think it's an issue, and I, I think Mike and I maybe disagree a little on this. I think it's an issue that will be decided when economic reasons force someone's hand, if that ever happens. And I don't know that... It's a lot easier to make fun of something on Twitter than it is to mount an organized boycott or you know, to put any kind of serious financial pressure on the team. I'm not saying that couldn't happen one day, but I don't think that the fact that people are tweeting about it like this means that's any closer. I think that they're hurting themselves in the court of public opinion to the extent they care about that. And maybe they don't at all. And they would say, hmm. you know, maybe people in California are making fun of us, but people who live in Woodbridge and you know, Prince Frederick, are they support see, what we're this doing. Is so this is the problem. You get, I don't think you play to your middle. You, you don't play to your base in this one. Well, You've already got your base. Right. You want to play for that middle ground. And to me, there are a lot of good fans in this town that have, that have almost gone on the other side and said, you know what, this thing's too much of a distraction. It, you can sense it on when you read the comments on his blog that there are really people that are just fatigued over it. That's and they're just like, I'm tired of the name. I'm tired of the money we're spending on it. I'm tired of the people. They're talking about putting a press conference together tomorrow where they bring out family of the people who made the logo to say, hey, look, the, the Native Americans made our logo. Like, you, you're going to... You're going to pit Native Americans against Native Americans? Like, it just, at some point, just say, we're going to keep it as long as we can. Right, and then show We don't up care about, about anybody else. LeVar, your thoughts? I think it's all details. Mm -hmm. I think all, all the conversation about it is, is just details. Is it closer now than ever before to it's changing? Details. Details meaning until there is something that truly, tangibly takes place with this whole thing, it's just going to be the same seesaw you know, yo-yo act every single year, year in and year out. Um, I, I say if you break down to the bare minimum of what the name is, you know what the name is, you know what it says. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to know what the name says. But that doesn't mean that for all these years um, that people haven't paid attention to the fact that this is a football team and this is its name and it's been other teams that are named that. So you're talking about a social conscious uh, of, of what's taking place. For me, do I think it's any closer? I think it's on people's radars, but you know, Dan mentioned boycotting. Like I think about, the first thing I think about is an organized boycott when Rosa Parks refused to move and, and black people organized and stopped riding those buses. Stop going to games, right. stop covering them, stop doing things that will, will impact them that way, and then you get changed. Will that take place? Honestly speaking, from my opinion, I don't think that there's enough real outrage for, for, for fans to stop buying tickets. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think there's enough outrage for fans to stop supporting this team. And, and unless something like that were to happen, it's not going to change. Well, I would say last, last thought, Mike. just social change forces economic change. And what you saw with what happened with Donald Sterling and NBA players as a whole decided that we may turn our backs on this game if this isn't taken care of. If that ever happens and some guys have some social conscience beyond what they have already, I think you might it's see a change. It's easier to take aim on a singular entity, a, a person, mm -hmm. 
than it would be to take place on on uh, what would be considered an institution, a franchise. Great point. A franchise. It's easier. You can you can yep. do away with a person. You'll watch the Belmont on Saturday, and if you think California Chrome will become the first Triple Crown winner since 1978. Some of us weren't born then. <laughs> um, all right, Mike, start with you. NBA Finals winner in how many games? I'm going to go um, the Miami Heat, and I will say it's going to take all seven again, and it will be as dramatic as it was a year ago. Heat and seven. What do you like, Dan? I'm going to predict that the Miami Heat win in six games. I, I, I really, I root against the Heat more than I root against any team in any sport. And I, but I just enter every series Why? with this. Cause I don't, I you just, hate LeBron. I hate LeBron, yeah. yeah I know. But I enter every dribble. series with this just like dread that it's impossible and it's not going to happen. And I feel that way again. I just feel like he's too good. <laughs> he's too good. And I remember game six and game seven of last year like they were yesterday. And it just could. They, I mean, the Spurs had that series one. And it should be great television. So I need yeah. like heat and seven, take, heat and six. I'm gonna take the other side of it, and I think that that San Antonio will be prepared. I think they they had it last year, and even though a year is is day and night from a year to the next, I just really believe that they have a a probably a a, a drive maybe a, a feeling that that's probably more intense than Miami. Miami may say, we heard LeBron say, we'll be prepared. It's, it's, it's one thing to be prepared as a champion. It's another thing to be a champion that lost as a champion and you're coming back to rematch that. Revenge factor. I, I, Spurs I think, in how many Spurs games? I think they get it in six. Spurs in six. Not, I'm gonna also take Spurs, I'll go Spurs in seven. Not to be understated is the Spurs, the way they won that game six in Oklahoma City and got the extra rest for a team that's full of veterans. Huge. I think that that's a factor and they have the home court. Well, Spurs the reality seven. of it All is right. you're not going to deal with two, two players playing like that, not even with Miami. It's must not watch even TV with though. Yes. All right, let's go uh, Stanley Cup Finals, coast to coast. You got the Rangers and the Kings. Kings, first time in NHL history, teams won three road game sevens to get there. Mike, who do you like? I like the Rangers, and I have no reason why. All I know is I was in New York 20 years ago when I got a, a job there Mark that Messier. I had no business getting, and I was like walking through Madison Square Garden when it was going on, and it was electric. And so I, I'm going to take the Rangers just based on nostalgia. How many games? <laughs> That's all right. Let's just six games. Rangers and six. I got the Kings in five. Wow. I think Kings the, in five. I think the Kings and the Blackhawks were the best that, that the hockey awesome. world had to offer this year. And that I think was that, a series. I think that either one of those teams would overwhelm the Rangers. So I'm going to say Kings and Kings five. Kings in five? I'm going with the Rangers. And, and the reason why I'm going to go with the Rangers is, is, is Lord Henry. Hank. Yeah. I, I really think that if he shows up and, and he puts that, that brick wall up, I, I think that's going to be difficult for L.A. to be able to – Outskate the, the quick, physicality. Just almost as good. Games? How, many games? How many games? I'm giving it five games. Whoa! Rangers are five. Whoa. Rangers right. are five. Right. Oh yeah, at some point it's got to catch up to the Kings, right? All those I games seven. I'll take the Kings. Kings and seven. Kings and seven. Why not? Why stop at three game sevens? Go four game sevens. You run the whole. I like this triple bowl prediction. Do we still have time to do uh, Yeah, we still have time for Belmont. We're adding a minute. Here we go, Mike. Will you watch on Saturday, and will California Chrome win the Triple Crown? I will watch because I was 14 years old when affirmed one with the jockey Steve Cawthon aboard, by the way. He wore pink. I had a little guilt and confusion about it, but that's all right. I watched. I liked it. And, and, and so, so bottom line is, it is a brave new world, LeVar. And the bottom line is, uh, lastly, I will say California Chrome is not going to win because you know why? Sally Jenkins is going to cover it, and she's going to jinx them. <laughs> All right, Dan. Will you watch it? Will he I watch? was convinced that he was going to say yes. Uh, no, I probably won't watch, although it's just mostly because I have to be at a parade with my daughter on Saturday. Oh, wow. But if I was well, home, I'd probably watch it. Good for you, man. The uh, Pride Parade. Is oh, the Pride the Parade. Oh, nice. Yeah, parade. Okay. Um, <laughs> Maybe I'll probably wearing pink. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> Brave new world. Does yeah. it change how we feel but about no, it? But don't, no, I don't think the California Crown will because these horses are not built to run that distance. All right, so you could the, the Triple Crown drought continues. LeVar, will you watch? Will he win? I didn't watch him when when I was at the Preakness physically. Right. What? I was there at the race track and did somewhere. not see him. You were drinking all those black eyes. So seasons. therefore, if I did not watch while I was physically at a track <laughs> while he was running, I probably am not you going to watch. Were you leaping over the bathroom stall? You know, I was sitting outside, but unless you're watching the big screen, like you turn and watch the big screen, you're watching the track. I watched the track. You're I watched the finish. Hungry, right? 
Yeah. You know, yeah. like Steph Curry and Tori Smith. Yeah. Big yeah. time. And, you know, do you no, think he's going to win? Awesome. I, so, I do think he's going to oh, win. So you say Triple Crown winner, it's but gonna, you History watch. is going to happen, and he's it's going to be the whole – memory of the nasal breathing strip that that was the reason why he <laughs> was be that much better than everybody right. else i will watch and i agree that he won't win so i'm, I'm with you on that mike all right mm. for everybody and you were at the white house last week i'd be I remiss was. not to mention on the on the uh concussion summit you got to meet yeah, the president they, they, i'm something like an expert on football fundamentals and safety so did you get a picture with right the press on. i did nice i certainly did you have a good visit to good. The it was very nice it was, it was very uh productive so very I was good honored yeah. and happy to be good there. man well for mike wise dan steinberg lavar arrington thanks for joining us on post sports live we'll be here next tuesday same place same time on the highest rated webcast bam <laughs> on washingtonpost.com <laughs>